Hey, I don't know if you know this or not, but I'm going to tell you just to let you in on a little secret. Our border is broken, okay? It is. Actually, it's worse than that. Our southern border is all but non-existent. Since Joe Biden became president and immediately reversed every single policy that Donald Trump had put in place to control the border, over 10 million, 10 million illegal immigrants have scooted into the United States, and we have not a clue as to who they are, where they are, why they came, what they're doing here, whether they have communicable diseases, or if they are ultimately here to conduct a terror attack on you and your family. It sounds insane, because it is insane. I mean, for the longest time, Democrats in Congress and Biden's boot-licking lapdogs in the media ignored the crisis. They denied that it was a crisis. And they labeled anyone who said it was a crisis to be a racist. Democrat-led big cities like New York, Chicago, Washington, D.C., all had mayors who boasted how their cities were sanctuary cities where illegals were welcome and they would not be treated so poorly as by those awful people in Texas. But then Governor Greg Abbott of Texas took them at their word about their superior morality and hospitality, and he bust and he flew thousands of the illegals to these big cities. You see, Texas has been overwhelmed by the millions of people flooding into their state who expected to be housed, fed, and given medical care. But Texas finally had a change of both heart and mind, and they decided to share their blessing with the big mouth city mayors, yeah. They sent what was just a small fraction to the sanctuary cities of what Texas has been dealing with for years. And as Forrest Gump would say, and just like that, those sanctuary big mouth, big city mayors started screaming they couldn't handle it. I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Yeah, uh, maybe not everybody can handle the truth, but you can. Now, Joe Biden pretends and he lies about why we have the problem and what he can do to stop it. He couldn't ignore it anymore, not when a long list of former federal officials issued a statement warning that the invasion, and yes, it is an outright invasion, and it's of mostly young, single, military-age males from all over the world, and it's likely inviting in anonymous agents who are being sent by China, Iran, Iraq, Somalia, Yemen, and other less than cordial countries so they can stage a massive attack on innocent U.S. citizens that might be comparable, but probably even larger than the savage attacks that Israel experienced on October 7th. If it should happen, God forbid, let's be clear that Joe Biden owns it. He and his left-wing lunatic sheep, as well as the complicit but disgusting media munchkins who pretended it just wasn't a big deal, they will be completely responsible for this disastrous policy that makes no sense, well, unless the Democrats believe that their pathway to winning future elections is by importing voters rather than recruiting them. You can criticize Donald Trump all you want, but he pretty much had the border under control for the first time in decades by a strict policy of building a border wall, instituting policies that asylum seekers had to remain in Mexico instead of showing up and given the golden ticket to enter the United States. Now, when I boarded the plane last week, I had to provide my government-issued photo ID. I had to subject my person to a body pat-down that was completely unnecessary. If it had been a pretty girl, I might have enjoyed it, but it wasn't. <laughs> and then I had to allow my carry-on bags to be opened and rifled through all of my contents. I was so tempted just to tell the TSA guy, hey, none of this is necessary because I actually identify as a 21-year-old illegal alien from China. Then they'd have to take my word for it since illegals are allowed to board planes without any documentation. As an American taxpayer and citizen, I am not allowed to do that. By the way, I travel extensively throughout the world and I have yet ever to enter any country without having to show a passport and then to verbally explain why I'm entering that country and where they can find me while I'm there. I'm going to be blunt. If you vote for Joe Biden and the people who helped him, 
keep this insane no borders policy in place, then don't complain when a child in your family dies from a fentanyl overdose or is kidnapped and trafficked as a human sex slave. We're losing our country and we're losing our kids to the lunacy of these policies. Look, I believe America is a great country because we do welcome legal immigrants who want to come here, who want to become part of us, pay taxes, contribute to our way of life, and who really can and who will make America great again. But letting in 10 million people who have demonstrated no love of our country or respect for our laws, or for that matter, any laws, that's not compassion. It's just plain crazy. My next guest is a fellow Arkansan, and he serves the state's fourth district in the House of Representatives. He's the leading expert in Congress on forestry, farming, and environmental policy, having earned his master's degree in forestry at Yale University. Yale. Hey, we won't hold that against him, okay? Would you please welcome a good friend, Congressman Bruce Westerman. It is great having you here, Congressman. And I want to start by talking about something your committee is dealing with. You're the chairman of the Natural Resources Committee. There is talk that the national parks may be turned into tent cities for illegals. Is that real? Well, unfortunately, Governor, it's not just talk. It's happening. It's happening in New York City. It happened last fall when uh, one of those big mouth mayors you were talking about, <laughs> Eric Adams from New York, Governor Hochul from New York, started reaching out to the Biden administration saying, we've got to have help. We have filled up all of our hotels. We're putting uh, migrants in and we need space. And as you know, space is, uh, is not very available in, in New York, except for a place called Floyd Bennett Field, which is a unit of the National Park Service. A million people a year recreate there. The Biden administration went uh, warp speed, waived all the environmental laws, and built a huge tent city right in the middle of Floyd Bennett Field. So the people that would have gone there for recreation and to enjoy a national park now cannot go. The people who pay the taxes that pay for that, because people who shouldn't have been allowed into the country are living there. In massive tent cities where they process two to 3,000 at a time through these tents. And another problem that field floods occasionally, and you may have noticed a few weeks ago, there was some strong winds and cold weather and they took the migrants and put them in actually Chuck Schumer's high school and sent the students home for remote learning while they sheltered them at the high school while the storm passed. You know, if I'm a parent in New York and my kid is sent home, can't go to school, is said, we're gonna disrupt your, your child's learning because we're gonna take some people who illegally came to the country and we're gonna feed them there, house them there, I might have a little bit of a problem with that. You know, when, you were, when you were governor of our great state, that might have created a little bit of problem had, had the situation arose like I that. guarantee you it would have created the problem. And you know, it's, it's bipartisan dislike for this. We, we actually had a Democrat assemblywoman from New York come to DC and testify on our committee on this. So people are fed up with it all across the country. It, it has become uh, not just the Southern border, it's all of America is a, a, a sanctuary city now. You know, going back to Arkansas, about 2 million people population. Since Joe Biden's been president, four times the population of Arkansas has come into our country illegally. Think about, mm. you know, all the houses, all the services, everything that it takes for the whole state of Arkansas. And you've got that four times burden added to, uh, to our country now. But he says it's your fault. It's Congress's fault. It's the Republicans specifically. It's you guys that won't. Uh, help him out here and work with him. Funny, it was working just fine. He took office and he undid everything that had been working. Well, it's, you, you've seen Democrat playbooks before. You know, they create a problem, they blame somebody else for it, and then they try to go back and fix the problem they created. So we're at that stage, they're trying to blame somebody else for the problem they created. And, uh, you know, Joe Biden has proactively, uh, he did away with the executive orders that President Trump had, the Remain in Mexico policy. Not only did he uh, stop construction of the border wall, it started tearing the wall down. 
you know, tax dollars had been yeah. spent to build the wall. They started tearing it down. It's almost like since President Trump did it, they just hate it so bad they're going to do the opposite, and you can see where it's got us. If Trump had created running water, they would have shut it down and said, you're going to have to walk six miles down to the creek and take a five-gallon jug. I mean, it's insane. Congressman, you're going to stick with us because I have a lot of things I want to get to, and I want to talk about the role of natural resources in this country, food and fiber. People do not appreciate the importance of that. We're going to be right back after the break. Don't you go anywhere. Well, still to come, filmmaker and actress Diane Cannon is here. And later, the Coney Norris Show pays tribute to Leroy Van Dyke. That's all tonight on Huckabee. Huckabee.com and sign up for his free newsletter and follow at Gov Mike Huckabee on X. And hey, welcome back, everybody. We're visiting with Congressman Bruce Westerman of the 4th District of Arkansas, Chairman of the Natural Resources Committee. You know, Congressman, I don't think most people fully appreciate, especially if they're urban dwellers, how important the natural resources of our country are, the forests, the soil, the lands. Without it, we don't have food. We don't, we don't get to, to live. And, and that's a committee that you oversee. Tell us in the big picture, why is that such an important part of America? Well, it's the necessity of, of life. It's food, clothing, and shelter. It's energy. It's those things that we literally can't live without. And I think that was highlighted during the pandemic. You know, if, um, if truckers had stayed home and not moved goods from the farm to the stores, I think we would have seen uh, catastrophes much larger than anything from the, the pandemic. But people forget that uh, it's our resources that not only provide the things to allow us to live, but it's also where wealth comes from by us utilizing those resources. You know, uh, a fellow Yale forester, uh, probably a more left-leaning guy, a guy named Aldo Leopold, he said there are two... Um, great spiritual tragedies when someone thinks that food comes from the grocery and heat comes from the furnace. Mm. And we're in a country where a lot of people, especially urban dwellers, don't realize when they go to the grocery store, when they hit the light switch, there's a huge uh, supply chain behind that. And, and if it weren't for the farmers and the ranchers of the country, who love the environment, quite frankly, a whole lot the, more the than some of these. original environmentalists. They really are, because their livelihood depends upon it. And, and I, I think that's lost on so many people on the left who claim they love the environment, but they do nothing to actually care for it. Let's take, for example, wildfires. They're horrible mm -hmm. uh, in the western part of the United States. We don't see it so much in middle America. Why? Because we manage our forests, for one thing. You do have warmer, drier climates in the, in the west. You know, speaking of that, we've lost 20% of our giant sequoias. Without going into a lot of detail, it's hard to kill a sequoia tree with fire. They're made, God made them to survive fire. Some of them are 3,000 years old, but mm. because of poor management decisions, in a two-year period, we lost 20% of them. And these are the only giant sequoias on the planet. Uh, and we still can't get our colleagues on the other side of the aisle uh, and in the White House to do the right thing and even manage in the giant sequoias so that uh, we can have them for the future. And when you're talking about managing, you're talking about sometimes cutting trees helps you to have more trees. I know that may sound illogical to some people, but you know, the people that say, don't cut a tree, don't ever cut a tree. They're sustainable, they're, they're renewable. But if you don't cut a tree, you end up creating an absolute mess for fire, a fire. Fire cuts the tree for you. So I, I say we, we love our trees to death. We yeah. don't want to <laughs> take care of them and discipline them and thin them out. And eventually fire comes along and forest are, uh, they're biological living organisms, and they compete for light, they compete for water, and they compete for nutrients. And when they reach the limit on that, somebody's got to go. So is there more forest now in the United States than there was 100 years ago or 200 years ago? Yeah, there's more forest in the United States than there was uh, at the turn of the uh, in 1900. And 
we lose more forests now because of development, not because of forest management hmm. practices. Uh, and that's not true every place in the world. But we've got such a wonderful resource that we've been blessed with here, and we should be better stewards of it and take care of it so that it'll be here for the future. What is the message that is not getting through to not just members of Congress, but to the average citizen about taking care of our land and, and preserving it and protecting it and, and being able to pass it on to the next generation? And I like to use the word conservation, and it means being a good steward. You hear this word preservation, and preservation is for art. I say preservation is for pickles. You take a <laughs> cucumber, yeah. boil it in vinegar, and put it in a jar. That's the only way you can preserve living things, um, and you, you kill them. So we've got to keep these forests alive and healthy, thinning, controlled burns, and um, just giving them an opportunity to uh, provide great water uh, quality. You know, Theodore Roosevelt called them the lungs of the earth. They breathe in carbon dioxide and breathe out oxygen. So you get uh, air quality, wildlife habitat. There's uh, Everybody wins with a healthy forest, but we just have to give them a chance to be healthy. Does it worry you that countries like China are trying to buy up land in the United States? And why on earth would the Chinese try to buy up farmland in this country? Well, and it's more than farmland. We just were able to stop something uh, last week. Uh, the New York Stock Exchange and the Securities and Exchange Commission were trying to promulgate a rule that would allow something called a natural asset company to be traded on the stock exchange so people from all over the world could invest in these natural asset companies and they were working with the Biden administration to go in and lease up federal land to quote conserve it but what they're really going to do is try to preserve it restrict access to it so if you're communist China you could invest in one of these uh, asset companies go buy a lease where we had say cobalt or nickel or copper and forever prohibit it from being mined because they control the world's minerals and elements. And as we push towards a, an electrified economy, you've got to have those minerals and elements so it makes us more dependent on China. When we do uh, unsmart things, like uh, say we're not going to export liquefied natural gas, that plays to Vladimir Putin's hands because it raises the price of gas and helps him to fund the war in Ukraine. When we say we're going to put up all these windmills and solar farms, that plays to China's hands because they control the market on that. Why don't we make things here in America? Why don't we use the resources we've got? We use them more efficiently and effectively, and we're better stewards than anybody else on the planet. Uh, but it's kind of a not in my backyard to, uh, you know, you reality. Congressman, you keep talking like that with, with some common sense, they'll throw you out of Washington. You won't belong up there anymore. You know, Governor, I study. <laughs> I studied engineering in undergraduate school and forestry in graduate school, and I often tell people I've got the, the two worst educational backgrounds to serve in Congress because engineers think with logic and reason, and foresters look at long-term horizons, and that's really not appreciated in D.C. that much. But for gosh sake, please stay there, Congressman. We need you there. Thank you for what you're doing for all of us in America, not just the 4th District of Arkansas. Do you want to keep up with Congressman Westerman, his Committee on Natural Resources, and the work that he's doing to promote forest management, which we need? Links to him are available at Huckabee.tv that will connect you directly with him. You might be surprised at how much importance there is in the natural resources for your life. Right now, Keith Bilberry is going to let us know what's coming up in the show. He's going to do it right now. Well, up next, award-winning actress Diane Cannon is here to talk about her life with Cary Grant and the inspiration behind her new TV series. It's all ahead on Huckabee. Samaritan's Purse is doing life-saving work in places that are often forgotten. Through their outreach, many lives have been helped in the most impactful ways. And hope and healing have made their way into the homes of the broken. I hope you'll help Samaritan's Purse to continue their great work in Jesus' name by supporting their mission today. And you can do so by scanning the QR code right there on your screen, or you can call the number on your screen and you can feel good about the way that Samaritan's Purse uses your gift 
with care and integrity. And the people that you help, well, they're going to feel good that you cared. So I say thanks. Thanks for opening your heart and for making a real difference. Well, my next guest is the first woman in history to be Oscar nominated as both a behind the camera filmmaker and as an actress. Her many movie and TV roles include Heaven Can Wait, Honeysuckle Rose, Death Trap, The Last of Sheila, and Ally McBeal. There's a host of hundreds more. For her latest project, she has executive produced a miniseries based on her best-selling memoir about her marriage to one of Hollywood's greatest icons, Cary Grant. It's called Archie, because his real name was not Cary Grant, but was Archie Leach. And this is a frank look at the real man behind the famous image. What an honor to welcome Diane Cannon. Please welcome her. Diane, it is so good to see you. And I'll say again, because when I was hosting a show at the Fox News Channel, you were one of my very special guests. I'll never forget what a wonderful uh, conversation we had. And it is a delight to see you again. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Well, you know, the, the project that you have been working on, and we're going to talk about it a lot tonight, but I want to go back to the fact that, I mean, everybody in the world thought Cary Grant was the greatest man in the world, and you got to marry him and be his wife for several years. Isn't that something? Yeah, I mean, it's like all the women in America were mad at you. Uh, they really hated you because you took their guy. You know what? My, I think I, I think part of the reason is because he, he pursued me for about eight months. Hmm. I kept saying no because my little voice said, don't go there. Yeah. I didn't listen because he was, he was a charmer. He was, when he walked into the room, everything and everyone stopped. I mean, he had that persona of being the most extraordinary, confident, sort of like the epitome of charm and that's grace, right. all of those things. And I, that's why he was such a megastar for so many years. I've never met anyone with that kind of presence. When he walked into the room, and then when he walked towards me, yeah. well, the, that kind of made me special too. So I, I fell for it big time. Well, I'm, I'm sure that you and several million other women would have felt the same way. <laughs> That's true. The, the book, and I read it back when it came out. Uh, Dear Carrie wrote this book, 2011. And it, it's a pretty remarkable story of how not just the two of you met, but the, the life you had. And, and Diane, I remember telling you when we talked before and having read the book, you always have been such a free spirit. You're, you just love to adventure and take risks and do whatever you felt good about doing. He was very calm and reserved. What a contrast of personalities you guys had. Yeah, we were very different. I think that was the attraction. I do too. And I think it was largely that he, I think he was somewhat in awe of your ability to just live and love life. I don't know that he ever experienced it because he was very guarded, wasn't he? He was very protective, yes. He was, he had a, a horrific childhood. He was abandoned as a little boy. And I think that he wanted to abandon people before they abandoned him. He, he, was, he was scared to love. I, I think I was surprised to learn about his childhood. Alcoholic father, uh, a mother who was in an institution for a long time. I, I don't think most of us can imagine that this confident individual that so lit up the screen had had such a horrendous experience growing up. No, it's hard to imagine. His mother was in, uh, institutionalized because her husband didn't want to pay alimony, so he took her supposedly to the doctor to just get shots and locked her up against her will. So she was a oh. very angry woman, and deservedly so. And this is the kind of world in which he grew up. That's right. How did he make that trek from being a person traumatized by his early life to being able to play that confident person and even get to being on screen. Do you know what he did, Mike? He, he invented Cary Grant. Hmm. He, he, he looked at all the leading men of the day and chose things about them that he found attractive 
and became them. And, but he had a heart. He had the heart of a little boy. Hmm. That's what attracted me to him. He had such a sweetness, such a purity hmm. inside of all that, that that appealed to me so much. You know, the book came out a few years ago. and Ten years. I, that's hard to believe. Ten years. But you've turned it into something truly remarkable in a uh, mini-series that is now available. People can get it on BritBox and Amazon. And we're going to talk about that when we come back because I really want to get into it. And I hope people will see it because I think uh, for all the Cary Grant fans, and there may be even more Diane Cannon fans, uh, people will want to see this remarkable series that you have uh, produced. And it's, uh, I think it's pretty significant that you have been Oscar nominated for being on both sides of the camera. The only woman ever in American history to have done that. It's a pretty big deal. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Well, stay with us because we're going to be back with more from Diane Cannon. We're going to get a sneak peek at the miniseries called Archie. It's all about Cary Grant. It's going to be right here when we come back on Huckabee. Well, later tonight, the illusionist Reza has something up his sleeve, and I'm sure hope it's not my billfold. We'll be right back. And welcome back. You know, we are so blessed to have the finest musical group in America taking care of our music. Please give your accolades to Trey Corley and the Music City Connection over there. Well, we're talking with uh, actress and filmmaker Diane Cannon about the new BritBox miniseries, Archie. It's about her marriage to movie icon Cary Grant. It's also available on Amazon Prime. Diane, uh, you know, this was a, a pretty big venture to put all of this into film, the story, and uh, to tell about, you know, when, when people hear the word Archie, they think, who is that? But it's Cary Grant. Archibald Leach. That was his real <laughs> yeah. name. That's a, uh, Cary Grant's a much nicer name than Archibald Leach. Yeah. Well, it certainly is one that we all, uh, you know, are endeared to. The only child Cary Grant had was the child, Jennifer, that he had with you. Right. And from all indications, that was the turning point in so many ways for his life, his, his, the cherishing of being a father. Yes, that's right. So it changed him in a lot of ways, didn't it? I think so. I think it softened his heart. I think he, he, he let that in. I think the relationship between a father and daughter is so much different than a husband and wife. Yeah. No, I think so. And even a father and a son. Yes. But there's something special about a father-daughter relationship. Well, you would know about that. Well, I would. I'd know a little bit about it. Uh, my boys think that my daughter was the favorite, and I said, no, I love you all the same, but I just love you differently. That's <laughs> because they were boys, and they acted like it. She was a girl, and she acted like it. You know, my first reaction in watching this is how amazing the actors were in portraying you and Cary Grant. Were, were you pleased with how that turned out. Very, very pleased. Yeah. They, they were wonderful. We worked for months together to try and get those effects, but because they did it, it was wonderful. Yeah. It wasn't that long after the birth of your daughter that Cary Grant decided just to leave acting and give it up. Was, was that shocking to you? I think it was to the rest of the world that he decided to retire from acting at that point. Well, he was talking about it while we were together. Yeah. Uh, dating, I mean, yeah. before we married. I think he got tired mm. of, of that. I think Was he tired of the image that he had to live up to, or was it just the work of the acting itself? I think it was both. Okay. I, I, think, I think both. I think it was just time to stop and do something else. And did he enjoy that next chapter of his life, just being a I dad? I think so. I think so. Um, he married again after we divorced. Mm. And he married a woman that I'm friendly with, a lovely woman. 
and he just settled down. He just stopped. Gosh, it's hard to imagine Cary Grant saying, I don't want to be an actor anymore. Yeah. You know, I mean, you're at the top of the profession. Well, I don't want to be an actor anymore on film, but maybe still in life. That's interesting because th there were things that you portray in the book and in the film as well, that he had a hard time letting people see who he was, letting them in. Was that because of the way he grew up? I think so. Yeah. I think sometimes our childhood affects us if we don't, if we don't deal with it, you know. And his was horrendous, so I think it did affect him. Did he ever say, Diane, I, I just I want to be more like you. I, I want to be more adventurous. I want to be more free-spirited. Oh. Was that ever a part of something he said? No. <laughs> no. But he did want that, didn't he? Don't you think so? Well, I think deep down he wanted to let loose yeah. and let go. And he did with me very often, not out in public and not with people, but I think that I think that I inspired that in him. Mm. I think that's what he liked about me because there were women far more beautiful and far more talented and far more everything. And I often wondered what it was about me that attracted him. And I think it was that love of life. I'm not sure that a lot of men in America would say there were more beautiful women and more talented women. I'm pretty sure they would not have said that. Well, you might say it. None of us would ever say that. You're kind. You also are involved in something that I find very intriguing. It's uh, an outreach in Hollywood, of all places, called God's Party. Right. Tell us about that. Well, mm, I was on the CBS slot for 12 years doing this thing called God's Party, to which you guys can come and play anytime. Thank you very much. And you You're should. You're wonderful. Yeah. And what we did was we celebrated God's love. Hmm. I think that we all have been loved, hopefully, have someone in our life we can love, but at a very dark time in my life, I experienced a love that was unlike any love I'd ever experienced hmm. before, and I wanted to share that, and I wanted to bring it to people. So I started a, a God's Party on the CBS lot. I had a band. I had 15 singers, and we just celebrated God's love. We sang and danced and ate and popped balloons and... <laughs> And, and that's what I'm, I'm going to start again. I did it for 12 years on the CBS lot and five years after that elsewhere. And now I'm look, we're looking for a home. We're going to reinvent. We're going to restart God's parties. We're looking for a home. Or we're taking God's parties to homes or to churches or to wherever they'll have us. Well, you know, I, I, California probably needs it. But if you want to do it in Nashville, I'm sure we would host you here to do God's Party at, uh, at our theater here on the TBN campus. Diane, it is just a delight to have you. I wish you the most success with the miniseries. It's, it's a marvelous portrayal of a person that every American uh, knows well, Cary Grant, but they may not really know Cary Grant until they read the book, and more importantly, they see this uh, fantastic series called Archie. Thank you. Hope Thanks. to see you again. I hope so too. Thank you, Mike. The miniseries is called Archie. You can watch the first episode free through Amazon Prime. It also offers a free trial subscription to BritBox to stream the rest. Please note the series depicts an accurate portrayal of the Hollywood relationship of Cary Grant and Diane Cannon. It's intended, as you might expect, for an adult audience. But if you'll go to Huckabee.tv, we will give you direct links to stream it and to keep up with Diane Cannon, a lovely human being. We're so honored to have her. Right now, from movie magic to real magic, Keith Bilbrey is going to tell you what's coming up next. Oh, what a legend, Governor. Coming up next, the illusions of Razor. Then stick around for some toe-tapping bluegrass with the Cody Norris Show. TV and get your very own Made in the USA Huckabee mugs, t-shirts, and more. And welcome back. You might have seen our next performer amazing audiences on 
Masters of Illusion, Penn and Teller, Foolish, and Duck Dynasty. Yeah, Duck Dynasty. Uh, you know, he's one of the most innovative, cutting edge magicians in the world, which has earned him the title of Illusionist of the Year. He performs regularly in Branson and currently on his Edge of Illusion World Tour. I want you to give a big hand and a wonderful welcome to Reza. Hey. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Nashville. Can I show you some magic? Yes. Let's try something with everybody. Everybody in our studio audience, everybody watching from home, I invite you to do this. You'll regret it if you don't. So try it with me. Governor, you as well. If you'd like to, everybody arms out like this. Just try it. Arms out. Cross the arms and then thumbs down like this. So pinkies up, thumbs down, and just lock together. Lock the fingers just like this. Keep them tight. Don't let go for the rest of the show. No. <laughs> You want to keep them super tight, thumbs down, and then just slowly, slowly go like this. Okay, we'll come back to that. It's cool. I just <laughs> want to see if that would work. But I need someone to help me out. So if you want to do it, make some noise. Who wants to come up on stage? Let's we'll volunteer. People are pointing. Do you, do you know this lady? That young lady right there. You know this lady? No, oh, you just, oh, you just think just she you should do it. What's your name? You think he should do it or you should do I it? I think he should do it. He should do it. Oh, how about you? <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's start with you. Maybe we'll come to him. What's your name? Colleen. Colleen. A round of applause for Colleen. Make some noise. Oh. Show some love to Colleen. <laughs> Colleen, it's great to meet you. Hi, pleasure to meet you. Yeah, I'll have you stand over on this side. Uh -huh. Take your left hand, place it on top of this box. Top of the box. Good. In a moment, you're going to reach your hand in this box without knowing what's inside. It's a lot like fear factor. So let me first ask you, do you have any fears, Colleen, that could fit into a box this size? Any fears? Yeah. Lots. Okay. Well, <laughs> think about one. Don't say it yet. In a moment, we're going to take one of your senses away. With one of our senses going away, the rest of our senses become more heightened, more aware, but also easier to manipulate. Name a fear. Spider, like a big... Spider. Spider. A big spider. What would a spider feel like? Audience, help us. Give me some key words. Fuzzy. Colleen, give me another word. Fuzzy. Creepy. Creepy. With the texture. The texture. Big texture. Furry. It'd be furry. It'd be fuzzy. Be furry, Colleen, fuzzy. visualize that furry. Fuzzy spider, the tarantula. Slowly, slowly, no sudden movements, reach your hand in the box, but slowly and you will not get bit. Maybe slowly. A, maybe a sharp bite? Just slow, slow, slow. Whatever you think of it feels like it's in this box. Do you feel anything in the box? <laughs> what, hold Sorry. on. <laughs> Colleen, <laughs> hand on top of the box. Okay. Are you good? Did you feel something? Oh, yes, I did. Is it alive? Uh, sure felt like it. Did, did you get bit or is it friendly? No, it was, it was friendly. It was friendly, but just moving. Did you feel like yeah, a, a leg? Or, oh, just touched you. But it was soft. Re Reaching. It was soft, but it just touched you. It's alive. It's moving. And just feel it one more time to be sure. Nothing. Just You may have scared him. I don't know where he is in the box. Tell me when you feel him. Feel around. Do you feel him? I feel fuzzy. Oh, you feel him. He feels what? Fuzzy. He feels fuzzy. He's alive. It could be a... A tarantula. Do you want to see? This is a... Brick. This is a solid <laughs> brick. Empty box, nothing inside. We're going to close it back up. Solid brick. You can even see. Get a nice close-up shot of that. That is a real solid brick. Colleen, feel this one more time and tell us. Is that a spider? Yeah, no, that's not a spider. Absolutely not. <laughs> Colleen, left hand back on top of the box. What other fears do you have that you have not mentioned? Do you have anything else? Yeah. What? I can think of a few. Or what would snakes. you prefer? Snakes. I, snakes, I do not snakes like snakes. you do not like. Does that concern you now, thinking of that fear, knowing that whatever you think of feels like it's in this box? They're that poisonous. concern you? There are poisons. <laughs> Let's do this instead. Name something that you're familiar with, comfortable with. Name a room in your house. Um, let's, go. Let's go with kitchen. Kitchen. Name something you find in your kitchen, like open a cupboard, a drawer. Name something you find in your kitchen. Name anything. Silverware. Visualize it. Whatever you think of it feels like it's in the box. Slowly, slowly reach your hand in the box. You're going to feel something. Tell me what you feel in the box. Do you feel something? I feel a fork. 
Of what? A fork. That's and a miracle. A spoon. And a spoon? A in the box spoon. of in the box. what you visualize. No knives. You feel in the box, it's a miracle. You feel a fork. <laughs> feel a fork a spoon. and a spoon. You really do? I really honestly feel a fork Remove and a spoon. Remove your hands slowly. No knives. Look, is this. Look, look, look. Oh my God! <laughs> Kind of scary, isn't it? Yeah, it's a little scary, and it's alive. If that, I hope that, if that's real, I'm Everybody out of show here. Show some love to Colleen. <laughs> Good job. Good job. Oh wow, Colleen, you stay over there by the snake. I don't want to get there. Reza has a residency in Branson, and you can see him all year long at the Reza Live Theater, as well as on the road as part of the Edge of Illusion World Tour. If you want tickets. Go to Huckabee.tv. We will connect you to get tickets. We will not send you a snake. No. Only tickets to this remarkable show. Right now, Keith Bilbrey, who really would love to have his own snake, he is going to conjure up some musical magic for all of us. Keith, take it away. Well, do not go away. The Cody Norris Show does their take on the auctioneer. It's right here on Huckabee. Join us next week for bull riding champion Josh Frost and the winner of The Voice, Todd Tillman, will be here to perform his new single. And welcome back. The Cody Norris Show combines a rhinestone-studded traditional image with a fresh new take on bluegrass music. It's earned this band multiple bluegrass awards, including Entertainer of the Year, Fiddler of the Year, Guitarist of the Year, and Bluegrass Album of the Year. Pretty much the whole thing. Their album called All Suited Up and their latest Rhinestone Revival both debuted in the top 10 on the Billboard charge. I want you to give a big hand and a big yeehaw to the Cody <laughs> Norris Show right here. <laughs> this great to have you. First of all, I want to know, I love the clothes, and we'd love for you to tell us where you got it so we can get Trey in some gear like that. All right, certainly. <laughs> Those suits are made by a good friend of mine out in California, Tim Jones Double A Apparel. Well, it's absolutely wonderful. Now, you and Mary are married. You were a classic violinist before you... I, I was, yes, yeah. And then I picked up the fiddle and... So what is different between the violin and the fiddle other than the way you play? Strings and strings. <laughs> <laughs> strings and strings, huh? Was it a tough transition? Yes, it was, yeah. Yeah, it's a completely different, you know, obviously genre of music, and it just, it takes a little bit of getting used to, yeah. Do you ever go back and play some classical stuff? I about can't, no. I can't, I can't do it. So you ruined this classical <laughs> musician, and you now have her playing... Bluegrass. I guess, I guess I do have to take credit for that. Yes, sir. <laughs> oh. Well, I'm, I'm glad you did because it's obviously working out very well for you. Um, Josiah, you played the banjo. Yes, sir. And when did you start playing? What, what I age started, were you? I probably started when I was about uh, 13 years old, I believe, playing the claw hammer style. Yeah? Mm -hmm. and, and who were your influences? Well, believe it or not, uh, the assistant pastor I grew up in in church played the banjo. His name was Jim Britton, and he used to play with Larry Sparks and Jimmy Jesse, and I remember seeing him playing when I was just a little boy. Big influence on me. And did he help teach you and show you some well, tricks and licks? Uh, and... Well, I, a lot of what I learned was self-taught, and huh. Cody's actually taught me a lot of banjo. Um, he, would help, he would help me when I would, you know, get with him, but yeah, I, I learned a lot of it by myself. And Charlie, on the bass, when did you start on that instrument? Uh, I played several instruments before, and I got real serious with it when I joined the group. I guess I had to. I guess you did. You, you want to be in a band? Okay, you play the bass. You don't, want to, you don't want to play the bass? You don't get in the band. That's right. It's simple. Yeah. Well, we're excited to have you guys here. Why don't you, uh, you know, just get all ready? Because while this group is getting set up, Keith is going to tell you 
how you can hear more of the Cody Norris Show. And I think you're going to want to. Just go to Huckabee.tv to find links to their tour dates, merchandise, and all their albums, including the latest Rhinestone Revival.